Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May 8th meeting of the Delta Independent Science Board. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Elizabeth Canuel, chair of the Delta ISB, and I would like to call the meeting to order. Um, before the meeting begins, I just want to run through a couple of business items. In accordance with federal, state, and local guidelines to protect public health and safety in response to the coronavirus disease, this meeting will be conducted entirely via remote access. We will take written questions and comments. Please email your public comments to disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov, or you can submit questions through the WebEx chat function. In your request, please indicate the agenda item to which you would like to provide public comment. And if you prefer oral comments, please use the raise hand function in WebEx or email disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov. Turn off your WebEx audio from your computer and dial the teleconference line listed in the meeting notice. Please place your phone on mute until prompted by staff to unmute. And uh, when providing public comments, please state your name and affiliation. At, at this point in the meeting, we'll uh, take a roll call, and I'll, uh, I'll call out each of the members of the Delta ISB. Please indicate in your declarations if you have discovered a conflict or potential conflict since the last meeting, and we'll need to recuse yourself on any item on today's agenda. So uh, I'll, I'll begin, Elizabeth Canuel, no changes. Steve Brandt. I'm here and no changes and sitting with a tie and coat on as the photo shows. Thanks. Uh, Tracy Collier. Uh, no changes. Joe Fernando. No changes. Tom Holzer. Tom Holzer, no changes. Jay Lund. No changes. Richard Norgard. Richard Norgard, no changes. Sorry, I had to take it off mute. Great, thank you. Vince Ratch. No changes. John Weens. John, I'm not sure. You may be on mute. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on to Joy Zedler. Joy Zedler, no changes. And uh, Edmund, do we know if John is on the line? See, I think I keep just dropped off. Let me send him an email. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, and uh, I think we've already checked in to see if all presenters are on the call. I believe that uh, John Calloway, Cheryl Patel, Susan Tatayan, and Karen Kafitz are, are all with us today. Yes, this is John. I'm here. Hi, Liz. It's Cheryl. I'm here. Hi, Liz. It's Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Th thank you, Susan. Thank Great. Thank you. Hi, Liz. Karen here. Great. All right. Um, so I'm going to begin with um, my chair's report and uh, a summary of some business matters. So the, the first item is to um, mention to the board that uh, we submitted a letter to the Department of Water Resources during 
the notice of preparation period for the Delta conveyance project. Um, some of you may recall that at our um, ISB meeting in January, Council Chair Tatayan informed the Delta ISB about DWR's notice of preparation for the Delta conveyance project during her uh, Council Chair and, and the Executive Officer report. Um, based on the update, there was interest um, from the board in, in terms of uh, inviting a representative from DWR to attend a future public meeting of the ISB to discuss the process and timeline for reviewing the EIR documents for the Delta Conveyance Project. Um, th there was also interest in sharing insights um, on how DWR could structure the EIR documents to facilitate future scientific review. And, and those insights uh, came from our experiences in reviewing previous EIR documents, such as those uh, that were prepared for the Bay Delta Conservation Plan and California Water Fix projects. On April 17th, um, as part of the notice of preparation comment period for the Delta Conveyance Project, I submitted a comment letter. The comment letter actually was um, sent from the, the leadership of the Delta ISB, so myself, uh, Jay, and, and Steve. And in that letter, we, uh, we did respond to the ISB's interest to A, um, invite DWR to a future meeting of the Delta ISB, and secondly, to highlight some areas uh, noted in our previous reviews that we thought would be pertinent to the upcoming EIR process. So that, that comment letter is part of the meeting package for today's meeting and has been posted on the events calendar webpage. And the URL for that is listed in the meeting notice. Um, any, any questions or, or comments on that? Okay, uh, my second update relate, relates to uh, the rapid change memo. Um, based on action that was taken at our public meeting on April 7th, Richard Norgard finalized uh, a memo to the Council and DPIC that summarized the recent discussions on the Delta, sorry, on Delta science during rapid environmental change, um, which was intended to help inform the upcoming science needs assessment. A copy of the memo is also a part of today's meeting package and posted on the events calendar webpage. And just as follow up for that, uh, Richard Norgard and John Weens are now working on a journal article um, on the topic of Delta science during rapid change. And as that uh, draft article advances, there will be opportunities for members of the Delta ISB to indicate their interest in being co-authors um, and to um, contribute to the process at, at future public meetings. Any comments or questions on, on that update? Okay, the, the third update uh, for me is um, pertains to the update that I gave to the council at their um, sorry at, at their April 30th meeting. So uh, as part of the council's meeting materials, they received a copy of the rapid change memo, a copy of the poster that was prepared on the IEP review that was initially targeting the IEP workshop in the spring, 
Uh, we also included a brochure on component one of the monitoring enterprise review and a copy of the letter that we submitted to DWR. So I attended the council's April 30th meeting and provided an update on our recent activities. Uh, it, it was a relatively short update. There were, there were only 15 minutes on the program allocated to, to the update. So I, I basically just walked the council through those four materials that were included in their meeting um, materials. Uh, I, there wasn't, again, it was a relatively short um, update. I'm envisioning that the next time the ISB gives an update to the council, it'll be um, perhaps uh, given a, a bit more time. But uh, there, there wasn't very much feedback from the council. Uh, it was mostly informational. However, uh, we did uh, get one comment from Oscar Fagaeus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, so hopefully he'll forgive me. But um, he, he did commend the uh, ISD on our letter an invitation to DWR to attend a future meeting of the Delta ISB and, and also liked the attention that we had given to some of the lessons learned from our prior reviews. Any questions on my update to the council? Okay, the fourth uh, update in my chair's report uh, and, and this relates to the Delta ISB's recommendation to the council on the appointment of the next Delta lead scientist. At the April 30th council meeting, I presented our recommendation for uh, Dr. Laurel Larson as the next Delta lead scientist. Um, I'm happy to report that the council um, voted unanimously in support of our recommendation. And as I understand things, Dr. Larson is scheduled to begin her position, I think, in September. Um, and some provisions are, are being made to uh, basically uh, promote interaction between Dr. Larson and, and Dr. John Calloway, the present Delta lead scientist, so that uh, there'll be a smooth transition in leadership of the science program. Okay. The next item, oh, sorry, was there a question or a comment? No, hi, Liz, this is John. She's gonna, I'm pretty certain she's starting um, August 1st. And my, I'll be finishing just before that, but we, have already spent a fair amount of time together online, and we'll, we, as you said, we will spend a fair amount of time between now and then, and and, and after August as well. Great, I'm I'm happy to hear that, John. All right, the the next uh, portion of my update relates to some membership changes on the Delta ISB. I wanted to bring everyone's attention to the fact that this is Joy Zedler's last meeting on the, the Delta ISB. She'll, she'll continue her services to the ISB until June 9th when her contract period ends, but this is actually the, the, last, uh, the last of our formal meetings where we'll have Joy as a member. And I, I just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes to acknowledge Joy. Um, she has, a, I think as the full board would agree, she's contributed in many significant ways to the, the Independent Science Board and the reviews that we've conducted during her tenure the board. Um, in particular, I'd like to uh, bring attention to her rich expertise in ecology, especially in the areas of restoration and wetland 
ecology, which have been extremely valuable to the board. She's also contributed significantly to our ongoing review of non-native species and has always provided a very deep and nuanced understanding of adaptive management in all of our discussions and reviews. So uh, personally, it's been an honor to work with Joy and on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank her for her service to the Delta ISB and I know that we will all miss her contributions. So th thank you, Joy. Thank you very much for your very kind words. I've got another month yet to um, try to fulfill that uh, um, phrase. Thank you. Great. Yes. And I hope our, at least our correspondence continues after you depart from the board. My pleasure. Uh, the, the second change in membership uh, is an announcement um, from Jay Lund that he has decided to step down from the position of chair elect. Um, on, again, on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank Jay for his uh, longstanding contributions to the leadership of the Delta ISB. Um, I know the, the membership appreciates his many contributions. Uh, for those of you in the audience, Jay has served in the full range of leadership positions, including chair elect, chair, and past chair, and has contributed significant time and energy to the board's activities. Um, in addition to his willingness to serve in these leadership positions, Jay has also brought a very deep knowledge of the Delta to all of our discussions and reviews. So I'm disappointed, uh, and, and this is just a personal thing, but, uh, but I am disappointed that Jay has decided to step down from the chair elect, but I am happy to report that he will remain on the board for another two years and will continue to participate and contribute to the board's work during his remaining time on the Delta ISB. So th thank you for everything you've done in your leadership of the board, Jay, and we look forward to continuing to work with you as, as a fellow member of the board. And, uh, we, it, and when we get to agenda item eight, which is um, operating guidelines, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about succession planning um, given this, this change. Okay, so uh, any questions or comments on our changes in membership? Uh, Steve here, I, I just want to uh, thank Joy again. And, uh, you know, it, it really has been fun working with you and I hope we can continue this. And uh, the invasives thing, your sort of in-depth knowledge of that topic is, uh, I know really pushed all of us on the writing team, and I think that's really been a benefit for you to uh, keep us in line on that. And it's been an extremely valuable uh, contribution, and uh, we're looking forward to finishing that off with you. Thank you, Steve. And any other comments from the board? Yeah, hi, Liz. This is not the board, but John Calloway, and I just wanted to also thank Joy. I've got, had the good chance to work with Joy since I was a postdoc at San Diego State way back in the mid-90s, long ago. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to interact again on the board with you. And um, I also want to highlight she encouraged me to apply for lead scientist, so I, I really appreciate her for pushing me to do that and engage on the Delta issue. So. As everyone has said, I think, Joy, your contributions on invasives, on restoration issues, adaptive management has all just been really a great addition to the board. So thank you very much. Thank you both, uh, Steve and John. I think uh, getting John to be the lead scientist was my biggest accomplishment. 
Well, let's also not, this is Tracy, let's also not forget that Joy has raised all of our consciousness on traditional ecological knowledge and traditional native knowledge. It's been great for all of us to, to have her remind us of that. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, this is John. Oh, uh, oh go, sorry, John. Go, go ahead. Yeah, this is John. I just got on. I forgot about him. Uh, and I'll join again because I hear an echo. But I also wanted to express my appreciation for Joy for all she's contributed. I even got to correspond with John's daughter. <laughs> That's a, a special. If I'm getting echoes, I'm going to go off and get it on again. Yeah, John, just okay. make sure to off your computer speakers from the WebEx. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just briefly walk through the agenda for today's meeting. We will. Uh, after I wrap up, we'll have a report from uh, the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, Susan Tatayan. Then we'll have a report from Delta lead scientist, John Calloway. Uh, we will then move into updates and discussion of current Delta ISB activities. And uh, Hold on a minute. And, and then we'll have a presentation from Cheryl Patel, our uh, new, a new addition to the California Sea Grant State Fellows Program. Uh, we'll, we'll then take a 30-minute break for lunch. And then when we return from lunch, we'll have a discussion and potential action related to planning future reviews. We will also discuss our operating guidelines, and then we'll uh, run through preparation for upcoming Delta ISB meetings. So without, uh, uh, well, actually, before I, I move on to uh, Susan's report, I just want to know how, whether there are any public comments on the items that I covered during my chair's report. There are none. Great. All right. Well, I will turn the uh, microphone, or I guess cell phone, <laughs> over to uh, Susan Tassian, the, the council chair, and, and she'll give us a, a report from the council. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to be able to be with you today. Uh, I. Also, we'll say thank you to, to Dr. Joy Zettler for her service and contributions to the Delta Independent Science Board. Um, although I didn't get to work closely with you, Joy, and, and I think we met only a few times in person, I, I so admire everything you've done, um, not only for the board, but, but the council. Uh, just to let the audience know, Dr. Zedler contributed to the ISB's work on a, a wide range of ec ecological issues, um, in particular restoration topics, one of the major interests of the Council and sister agencies and, and the Delta in general. And as um, Dr. Collier said, she provided uh, very helpful input on value of the value of Native American traditional ecological knowledge, and and the council staff incorporated that information in its uh, proposed ecosystem amendment to the Delta Plan. Um, in addition, she co-led with John Weens uh, the development of summary sheets for major Delta ISB thematic reviews. Uh, and this was based on stakeholder feedback at, at the ISB's 2017 retreat. And use of these summary sheets is now common practice for major Delta ISB reviews. So 
Thank you so much, Dr. Zedler, for all the work you've done to help educate the council members and, and improve the council's work and the Delta plan. Thank you. Appreciate it. So speaking of the Delta Plan Ecosystem Amendment, um, during the May 1 session of the council meeting, council staff presented a revised draft amendment to Chapter 4 of the Delta Plan, which is the ecosystem chapter. And this draft incorporates input and comments uh, received on the November 2019 preliminary public review draft. Uh, including input from the ISB and external peer review. The Council voted to proceed with the environmental review process under CEQA using the May 2020 draft as a proposed project. Uh, so thank you for helping the Council improve the draft amendment to Chapter 4. Um, we started this long, thorough, input intensive amendment to this chapter in the fall of 2017. And as you probably remember, uh, staff used ISB feedback on synthesis papers to develop uh, the approach to the ecosystem amendment. In August 2019, council staff asked the ISB to provide feedback on the preliminary performance measures and data sheets for those measures. And, and as the ISB recommended in its 27 September 27 letter to the Council, uh, the staff revised the data sheets and Appendix E uh, to address ISB comments. Um, and in late November 2019, the Council staff asked the ISB uh, again to review the November draft um, and facilitated the independent scientific peer review that the ISB recommended. So thank you to the ISB for helping the Council draft a, a very robust amendment to the Delta Plan Ecosystem Chapter. Uh, this has been one of my priorities and this is a major milestone in getting to an amended Delta Plan that will pick up the pace of ecosystem-based management in the Delta watershed. So now I'd like to give you a very brief uh, overview of a recent court ruling um, that, uh, in my mind, validates the Delta Plan. Uh, on April 10, the California Court of Appeal for the Third Appellate District issued its decision in uh, a case called Delta Stewardship Council Cases. And I um, won't cite all the case numbers. I will say on every single issue in those cases regarding the legality of the Delta Plan, the court sided with the council. And the court acknowledged the broad discretion and uh, that the Delta Reform Act confers to the council. So to quickly highlight some of the appellate court's opinion, uh, first off on uh, one of our really important policies, uh, WRP1, uh, which is the Delta Plan's regulation on reduced reliance on the Delta through regional self-reliance. The court rejected every argument asserted against WRP1 and found that WRP1 fell well within the discretion afforded to the council. Um, the court uh, fully blessed WRP1 as a reasonable and permissible regulation that furthers the co-equal goals. On performance measures, the court reversed the trial court's holding that the Delta Plan violated the Delta Reform Act by failing to include numerically quantifiable performance measures. And it found that the Delta Plan amendments uh, rendered this issue moot. Uh, its remand instructions directed to the trial court are to dismiss this challenge. Uh, the court also held that the performance measures uh, don't need to be regulations. Uh, however, if the council sees fit, it, it uh, has the discretion to adopt performance measures as regulations as necessary. 
On conveyance and storage options, the court held that the Delta Plan amendments rendered the trial court's ruling uh, on conveyance and storage options moot. Uh, the court reversed the trial court's determination and directed the trial court to dismiss as moot any contention that the original Delta Plan's approach concerning conveyance and storage was inadequate. And as with the performance measures, the court held that conveyance and storage options uh, don't need to be regulations, uh, which is siding with the council, but they, they did hold that the council has the discretion to adopt these options as regulations as, you know, based on council's expertise. Uh, other parts of the Delta Plan, the trial court had upheld all the other parts of the Delta Plan and the appellate court affirmed that, that ruling. Um, the, it, uh, the appellate court held that the council's appeal procedures are valid and the Delta Plan is based on best available science and the court rejected the argument that the, that the Delta Plan slow policy was arbitrary. So at this point, I just want to give the Delta ISB a great big thank you for all your reviews and advice on the Delta Plan. Uh, it made the Delta Plan a solid, scientifically defensible plan uh, as evidenced by the appellate court's ruling. Thank you, thank you very much. And that concludes my uh, chair's report. Thank, thank you, Susan. I'm, I'm really happy that the, uh, the board has been able to um, help provide maybe some scientific rigor uh, behind the, the Delta Plan, and I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that the uh, appellate court um, uh, upheld uh, many of these items in, in its uh, in its case. So that thank you, Susan, for those updates. Any uh, comments or any comments or questions from members of the board? Are there any public comments on the report from the, the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council? There are none. Okay. Th thank you, Edmund, and, and thank you, Susan. Let, let's You're move welcome. on. To, oh, okay. Let, let's move on to the Delta Lead Scientist report um, from John Calloway. Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, I want to just start out to let you know that um, I encourage you to look at the Council's webpage because uh, Susan Tatayan has a new blog out on the challenge and need for really effective science communication, making a link to, the, you know, the communication around uh, coronavirus and the challenging situation that we have with such few opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction and how, how we need to be even better at making um, a strong case for the importance of science and communicating the complexities of science in an understandable way. So I encourage you to look at that blog from Susan. And then in addition, I wanted to um, uh, let you know that another action that occurred at the council meeting um, at the end of the month in April was approval of the contract for the journal San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science. And, um, this, that journal really is a key resource for the science community in the Delta across the whole estuary and the watershed. And it's um, supported almost entirely through the, by the council. But, um, and with that, the support, the journal is able to be a, a complete open access journal with no fees for authors or for, or for readers. So it's really a great resource that the council supports. And there is matching support from UC Davis, from the California Digital Library, and from others, but um, the council really is the key supporter of that. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of those two things. 
Um, and then I will move on to let you know one item um, is that the Social Science Task Force, their strategy for improving social science uh, research and integration in the Delta what came out since our last meeting. I, we, I updated you briefly about it then, but the actual report is now available. Jim Sankirico from UC Davis, who was the chair of the task force, presented the report's findings and recommendations to the council last month. And I think there was interest from the council. A number of council members really um, were engaged on thinking about how we improve social science and, and how we can make a better case for that in the Delta. Um, and in addition to the strategy that's come out, the staff is thinking um, significantly about how to implement those efforts. And I did want to let you know the recruitment for the C Grant position, the extension specialist with a focus on Delta social science issues is moving forward. We um, have a short list of candidates that I think will be set up for interviews in June. Uh, either the end of this month, June or July, depending on how it can all work out with the current situation. But there will be um, public online presentations from all the candidates. And as those are scheduled, we'll let you know so that you could um, get a chance to see some of the candidates for that uh, position. So before I move on, move on any questions on any of those topics? Okay, then I also wanted to let you know that the Delta Science Fellows, that um, was one of the key ways we support science with competitive, re competitive uh, funding in the Delta. Those uh, were announced this morning on the Council's email list and on the Council webpage, as well as on Twitter on Science Friday. So if you follow the Council on Twitter, you'll get lots of information about the um, awardees. I will just briefly let you know there were 10 um, fellows that, that were announced, five postdocs, four PhD students, and one master student. They come, a, a large number of them, as you might expect, come from the UC system, but there's also a student from um, Cal State East Bay and a postdoc from Stanford. The students and postdocs from Davis, Santa Barbara, and UC Berkeley, covering a wide range of issues from benefits of habitat restoration, a wide range of fish issues and salmon issues, contaminants, nutrient dynamics, including work on operation baseline, carbon dynamics and climate change issues and invasive species. So um, if you haven't seen that announcement, um, we will forward it to you so that you can get a chance to see who some of the uh, awardees are. And um, then I also wanted to let you know about the Science Action Agenda um, and the update to the Science Action Agenda. You, I think you all are familiar with the Science Action Agenda. The current version of the Science Action Agenda runs from 2017 to 2021, and we are now just beginning to work on plans to update for 2022 to 2026. And if you listened into the discussion on on the science needs assessment workshop a couple weeks ago, you heard Steve Brandt mention that the, the update to the science action agenda, it's definitely, we're making a strong effort to coordinate it with the science needs assessment work. And um, based on the feedback that we've received through the DPIC science funding govern and governance initiative and elsewhere, we're making a really strong effort to clearly link the science actions, the priority science actions that will be identified to management needs and management questions. The, the focus of the science action agenda is on current management challenges, immediate management challenges, and what science we can do to address those immediate challenges. So it really is a companion to the science needs assessment that has a much longer term focus, a longer term um, t time frame. So those, we're working to coordinate those and to make sure they're going forward in parallel. So that the update to the Science Action Agenda is just getting underway. We're beginning outreach to uh, get input on those management questions first, and that's being done through the range of collaborative groups that exist in the Delta, like the IEP, the Collaborative and Adaptive Management Team, or CAMPT and CSAMPT, DPIC, the Regional Monitoring Program, 
as well as outreach to individual agencies and stakeholders. So we're, that's just getting underway and will be taking place over the next few months to get their input on what they see as some of the priority management questions within the Delta. Staff at the Science Program will be compiling and consolidating that input, and then we will have a workshop in late summer or early fall to discuss those management questions and try to get some agreement on the priority management questions and needs that will then guide the direction and development of the science actions to address those questions. And that will take place um, later this year and early uh, throughout 2021 with a target to have the science action agenda finished towards the end of 2021 to set up the um, priority action issues going forward into 2022. Any questions on that science action agenda issue? Okay, then I will move on to just that I want to highlight uh, a, a recent article that uh, I presented to the council uh, at the end of last month. <laughs> the title is uh, Changing Estuaries and Impacts on Juvenile Salmon, a Systematic Review. Um, and this was done by Emma Hodgson and her colleagues at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. They looked at 160 published articles on human, juvenile salmon survival and migration. And um, uh, there was definitely a strong focus on work from the Pacific Northwest. They surveyed everywhere they could, but the majority of the articles they had came from the Northwest, including some work uh, from, from the Sacramento uh, Delta. Um, what they did was they wanted to highlight the linkage between the human activities that occur within the estuaries, like pollutant inputs, changes to flow, shoreline development, other activities, to stressors that affect salmon, and then link those stressors to responses that um, the salmon show in across, a, and the responses are on a variety of scales, from physiological effects, impacts on survival of individuals, to population level effects. What they highlight, um, actually I chose this in part because uh, I know one of your first uh, letters, it wasn't really a formal review, but you had a letter on stressors that highlighted that there is, ranking them is really a challenge and it's multiple stressors that are critical. And this article I think highlights similarly the importance of a mix of stressors. They, they um, in looking at their review of all these articles, they highlight um, where evidence is found of support that particular stressors do affect, have an effect, and um, the agreement across them to look at the confidence of those effects. What they found was that pollutants, habitat connectivity, flow, and a parasite sea lice that is really common in, with aquaculture in the Pacific Northwest, that those four there's more evidence for the impacts of those stressors on salmon than others, but they do highlight the importance of looking at um, interactions among stressors and as we are thinking about linking insights from that sort of research on stressors to management decisions. So um, that is uh, all that I have. If there's any questions at all, happy to answer them or turn it back over to you, Liz. Any questions from members of the board? <clears throat> John, I, I was just gonna ask a, a quick logistical question and that's about the Bay Delta Science Conference. Um, have there been any updates on rescheduling that? Yeah, so it is, you know, it normally is scheduled for the fall of the um, even year, so it would be coming up this fall. It, it, um, has, it was postponed actually not because of the coronavirus, but because of um, construction work at the Sacramento Convention Center, and we wouldn't have access to the Convention Center under construction. <laughs> the current plan, things are certainly in flux, but the current plan is that it will be, take place in the spring probably in um, March or April of, of 2021. Of course, that is pending the completion of construction at the Convention Center and our um, ability to meet in person. Um, 
but that the, so the plan currently is for the spring and given that the IEP workshop is, is usually right at that same time period, we have been interacting with IEP to have them join our, the, the Bay Delta Science Conference jointly so that there would be a, a track or a, a series of sessions within the conference that would be devoted to IEP. But that's, that's certainly still in flux. And as things are uh, more finalized, um, we, will, we will update you on that. Great, thank you. So I didn't hear any uh, questions or comments from the board. Are, are there any public comments for, for John? There are none. All right, Th thank you for those updates, John. And uh, now we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is updates and discussion on current Delta ISB activities. And I'll just um, ask if, if there are public comments, we will wait until the end of this agenda item be before we take public comment. So the, the first update will be from Vince Resch, and he'll give us an update on the monitoring enterprise review. Thank you, Liz. Uh, as all of you know, the uh, Monitoring Enterprise Review <clears throat> has two components. The first component was done by ESSA and its partners and basically revolved around the development of a comprehensive inventory of monitoring activities. Uh, that is now complete. The contract with them is, is over. Uh, they have produced a series of reports, held a workshop, and have also produced a brochure that outlines the, uh, the material that they have, have developed. Uh, component two, which we're in now, is the Delta ISB's assessment of the monitoring enterprise. And we're using, of course, the material that we obtained from ESSA uh, and also uh, a variety of other sources that I'll, I'll go over in my report. Now, first, the Delta Science Program is updating all of the products from component one for accessibility, and these will be <clears throat> released as this gets completed. I have completed a summary of all the products of Component 1 and the inf information collected to date. Uh, this is to be used for Component 2, and this has been circulated to all of the lead authors for comments. Uh, we have developed a tentative outline of the report of the Monitoring Enterprise Review. Uh, and the material that we uh, prepared is a summary of the sheets uh, of the reports from, the, uh, from ESSA uh, is now being uh, inserted into that outline in terms of uh, getting this into a, a format that uh, can lead to at least the beginnings of a report. Uh, I will start this, John will go over the document, and then we will circulate it to other lead authors for their comment and additions. Now, uh, as you saw from Edmund's notice, we finalized the monitoring questionnaire, and this week was sent out to the broader monitoring community in the Delta. And part of that was the IEP mailing list, which we used uh, in the IEP review. The questionnaire is also posted on the Delta ISP meetings page and events page. Uh, public members on the call are encouraged to complete the questionnaire, and again, for everybody that does it, we appreciate the input that we're getting. Now, in terms of the plans for the monitoring enterprise review report, uh, we hope by August that we will be up to date in terms of the text that we are preparing, the analysis of the questionnaire results, and preliminary recommendations uh, regarding our review. Uh, we will also have a list of questions and appropriate lists of persons for the interviews. Now, our goal at minimum is to pass on the information that we have contained to the continuing and new board members, basically to avoid duplication of the efforts that have been done thus far on the monitoring enterprise review. Uh, 
we have a list of interview interviewees, uh, but again, with the uh, with the slowdown because of the coronavirus, uh, we don't know uh, if it would be better to start those or to leave them to the new and existing board members. So thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Vince. Uh, thank, thanks for, I guess, all of your work on this review, but, but also advancing it and ensuring a, a smooth transition to the next group. And Liz, this is, this is John, Liz. I just wanted to remind everyone that um, I mentioned last month the science tracker will be uh, online inventory, and that inventory that was done for the monitoring enterprise review will, will be a key source of um, projects for the, the science tracker. So that inventory as well will, will continue forward through the science tracker. Uh, John, has the contract been awarded for the Science Tracker? Yes, it has been awarded, and it was awarded to ESSA. Yeah, so uh, there's a continuity is ensured in that regard as well. All right. Th thank you. Uh, Liz, just one more suggestion. This, uh, the monitoring work on science for the Delta is is really eternal in its importance. Um, it might be worth having us think a little bit, not today, but, but over time, on should the science board essentially constitute a standing group that continuously monitors the monitoring enterprise over time, rather than having it once every few years where we devote a tremendous amount of effort. It might be useful for us to have a really a continuing effort to keep track of events on monitoring. Thank you, Jay. Yes, thank, thank you, Jay, that, that's a good idea. Um, okay, so we will, we will go on to our next activity, which is a report from Steve Brandt and John Weens on the Ecosystems Review. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm not sure quite what to say. We're continuing to work on uh, a draft of the review document. Uh, it's, we've received comments on it from several um, board members who are not part of the rising team. And I'm currently trying to integrate the comments and edits. Uh, I should finish that in another day or so, and we'll circulate it to the writing team. And we will then look at what we need to do and look at the time schedule for getting the draft done. We still hope to have something to uh, share with you at the June meeting, but we'll just have to see. Yeah, we have, uh, thanks, John. We've put together a, a detailed and I think reasonably realistic uh, uh, timeline for doing things, and hopefully by May 20th, we would have a complete draft that would then go to the full board and also go out for uh, to the public at that stage. Ultimately, We'd like to get the uh, get it done by August 14th and have it approved uh, before the board members leave. Great. Th thank you both for leading that review. Any comments or questions from members of the board? All right. Uh, not hearing any, we will go on to our next update, and this is on the water supply reliability review, and I believe Jay will give that update. Uh, we've, we've been uh, plugging along on this. Uh, it's been slower than any of us would like. Um, 
but I, I, we have, are making some some uh, some progress on it, and I think uh, after the end of the semester, we'll we'll be able to move hopefully faster on it. Uh, we have uh, assembled a, an outline of of what the current uh, shape shaping uh, report is to look like um, that you should all have before you, I think, um, just to give you a sense for what we're working on and where we think it's going. Tom or Joe, do you have anything to add? No, I think uh, we should be able to do this uh, pretty soon, I, I hope. As you said, after the semester is over, now it's almost over. <laughs> So we should be able to get this thing wrap up, at least the first version, first draft. Thank you both for working on that review. Any comments or questions from members of the board? Yeah, uh, this is uh, Tom, Tom Liz. Uh, I think we really would appreciate uh, people looking at the outline because that's really what the report's going to look like. Uh, and it, it, w it won't take a lot of time to do it, but um, getting, getting any comments on whether or not we've struck the right balance from the, from the impression of the board would be useful. That, that, that's a good idea. It's better to get feedback early on in, in the process. Okay, we will move on to our next update, which is the science needs assessment, and Jay will also give that update. Um. That also has been sort of interrupted and delayed, I think, quite a bit by the pandemic, as, as many things, most things in the world have been. Um, we've got the uh, recent paper out for comment, and that's nominally closed May 1st, but I'm, I'm sure we'll still enter, be happy to see more comments coming in. We had a, a very useful little workshop, first of four workshops, uh, on uh, April 28th, where um, John Calloway gave a nice overview of climate change in the Delta, and we had an overview of the briefing paper by Steve, um, and a, a very useful, I think, discussion, including uh, uh, some use of a survey method, a Mentimeter, to get people, solicit people's comments uh, on different questions, and those, I think, turned out to be very useful. We've got three more of these uh, workshops um, June 3rd, July 28th, and September 9th. Uh, each of these workshops, we're trying to reserve uh, at least a third of the time for Q&A and, and discussion. I think that's that's working out pretty well. Steve, would you like to add anything to this? Uh, not much. We uh, we had 70, I think, participants in the first workshop, and and I we had a sort of a discussion of it yesterday, and uh, I think all of us felt very positive that that workshop gave us a lot of very useful information. Uh, we do, uh, as a reminder, we do have a 15-member uh, planning team that's, that's working through this whole process. The next workshop would uh, be on June 3rd, and particularly we're going to have a, a panel. We've identified some potential panel members, and that will be more focused on management Given what we learned in the first workshop about projected climate change, the, we would then ask managers what questions will that raise for management decisions and what sort of science do managers need to know in that context. And uh, then we'll have a third, and a, a third workshop on July 28th. We'll talk about, given the manager's needs, what science do we need to begin now to, in order to meet those management, projected management needs in the future. And then finally, September workshop is to talk about what the uh, changes might that mean for science governance, funding, and integration. Ultimately, we have a tentatively rescheduled the workshop in early October, but uh, we all realize that uh, 
that may not happen. So we are beginning to discuss alternatives for that, whether it's a virtual workshop or some other sorts of alternatives. But that's all I've got. Great. Yeah, it's it's nice that uh, you're able to uh, make progress on on this work. Uh, I I know that there have been interruptions because of the coronavirus situation, and uh, fortunately, I think one of the things that's come out of the coronavirus situation is that we're all learning how to work much more effectively uh, from from remote. Uh, locations and even though uh, remote participation doesn't uh, re replace in-person interaction, I, I think that it, it can be quite effective and, and so it's, it's good to see that this group is uh, using that, that venue to <coughs> keep momentum on, on the topic. Um, any questions from members of the board, questions or, or comments on the science needs assessment? Okay. So uh, next we'll go on to the IEP review and uh, Vince was going to give us an update on, on the status of that review and I, I guess primarily the outreach associated with that review. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, as Liz just said, we're in the outreach stage of the review and the big uh, thing we've been waiting to do is to have a meeting with the IEP directors regarding a discussion about our recommendations and uh, how they could be implemented or modified. Now, at the end of the last month, though, we were contacted by Stephanie Fong of the IEP with concern about how these last, the last three recommendations of our IEP review uh, could be dealt with in setting up a meeting with the directors. Now, let me go over these three um, different recommendations. This is six, seven, and eight of the report. Six was a formal transparent assessment is needed to develop a consistent set of goals that define IEP's mission and activities in addressing the diverse management needs of the Delta. Seven was in-depth discussions of IEP's organization and operations, including alternative organizational structures. And eight was prioritization, prioritization of IEP's activities to justify additional funding and partnerships and or reallocation of resources among different activities. We then had a conference call between Steve Culberson and Stephanie with Tracy, myself, and Dick Norgard. <coughs> Steve and Stephanie felt that they need more concrete suggestions on how these three recommendations can be implemented before we meet with the directors. Uh, one of the ideas that we are pursuing is to look at the possibility of the directors bringing in external advisors specializing in organizational structure to present various options that they have. And one avenue that we suggested is the creation of a joint powers authority, which is a, the approach that's being considered by other teams working in the Delta. Tracy and I then spoke with Karen and Edmund about the possibility of uh, looking into this joint powers authority further, and they agreed that Edmund will pass on information to us as to how this is being considered in the Delta, including the work as part of the science need assessment. We have indicated to Steve and Stephanie that we'll get back to them on this issue because this is really the main follow through that we are concerned about having the meeting with the directors and the discussion about the recommendations. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Vince. I'm, I'm glad to see that the discussion with the IEP uh, leadership, namely Steve and Stephanie, are, are moving forward and that there's attention to 
considering other organizational structures. Any comments or questions from members of the board? So Liz, this is Tracy. I just wanted to add on to what uh, Vince's great summary. We realize that we, we've discussed this as a full board a couple of times that we are, we're sort of walking a fine line here in terms of we are not necessarily the people with the depth of knowledge and experience to, to concrete, to make concrete suggestions as to how to deal with these three pretty far reaching recommendations. Um, but we do feel that it's appropriate for us to at least help advance the thinking in terms of considering other options, uh, other structures. Um, but we just, we're, we're walking a fine line and saying that we don't want to be prescriptive about what the IEP should do, to, how to address these three major um, recommendations. And any advice or counsel or uh, worries from other board members would be very welcome either now or in the next week or two. Yeah, I, I agree, Tracy, that we, I, it, when we prepared that report, we were very purposeful in, in not recommending a specific structure, but pointing out some, some models and suggesting that they think about structure. So it, it's sort of a, a delicate balance between advancing thought and discussion on that topic, but again, not not being prescriptive in the direction that we offer. Okay, so uh, so that concludes our updates on Delta ISD business. I guess I'll just ask one more time if, if there are comments from the board on any of the items that, that came up. And if, if there are no comments or questions from the board, are there any comments from the public? There are none. Okay. So we will, uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but we're going to move into our next agenda item. And this will be a presentation by Cheryl Patel, our um, California Sea Grant State Fellow. So Cheryl is going to give a presentation entitled Gut Check, Investigating Cupapod Consumption of Phytoplankton Using Q. PCR. This is work that, um, that that was the focus of Cheryl's uh, master's project at San Francisco State. So I think uh, everyone on the board has, has met Cheryl, but for the audience, Cheryl is, the, uh, is beginning her tenure as a California Grant State Fellow, and she'll be providing staff support to the Delta ISB with an initial focus on the monitoring enterprise review and the science needs assessment. Cheryl is currently completing her master's degree. Uh, she is working um, with Dr. Wim Kimmerer at San Francisco State University, and her research is focused on food web interactions in the cash complex and northern San, uh, sorry and the northern Sacramento River so we thought that uh, since Cheryl is a new addition to our team this would give everyone an opportunity to learn more about Cheryl's research and interests and uh, also if we know more about Cheryl that this can help us to ensure that Cheryl gets the most out of her fellowship opportunity so at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Cheryl, and I think we're going to switch over to WebEx for viewing Cheryl's presentation, but stay with the phone for 
um, oral discussion or, or questions that follow the presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna basically uh, ask you to, uh, to begin whenever you're ready. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, Liz, that was a great introduction and um, I appreciate it. So um, I, I, I hope that you can all see my screen right now. I'm showing my title slide. Um, so my name is Cheryl Patel. As Liz mentioned, I am the Sea Grant State Fellow working with the Science-Based Adaptive Management Unit in the Delta Science Program. And um, I want to thank everyone for giving me, um, allocating me some time to talk about my background and the work I've been doing for my uh, master's thesis work. So as was mentioned, um, I've been working on investigating copepod diets in the upper San, uh, upper San Francisco estuary, and I'm using qPCR to do it. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background today, um, talking about the organisms that I'm focused on, then go into some of the research questions that um, came out of that background knowledge, and finally go over the methods I'm using to gather data to help me hopefully answer my research questions. So let's start here. Um, we know that copepods are a really important part of the aquatic food web. They're really a key um, part of it because they transfer phyto photosynthetic primary producer energy like from phytoplankton up to higher trophic levels like fish. So they're a key part in that energy transfer happening. So, but in San Francisco estuary, copepods are a really important food source for juvenile fish. For example, the endangered delta smelt, um, it's going to be consuming a lot of copepods as in its larval stage, but it also consumes copepods throughout its, its entire life. And so um, in our estuary, actually, fish are food limited. And so you can imagine if a larval stage fish is not able to find enough food during that important stage where they're doing a lot of growth and development, they might not be able to reach adulthood and reach um, a reproductive stage. So you can imagine the stress that um, food limitation can bring on a population, especially one that can, is declining. So then the question um, that comes up is, you know, where is that food, right? So um, if we look at specifically the copepods in those fish diet, we see that in the estuary, the abundance of the copepod species has really changed in the last 40 years. Species that were once very abundant and important food sources for the fish, like uh, Eurytimera finis, a calanoid copepod, their um, abundances have really uh, lowered um, over time. And the remaining copepods that have that high abundance now, such as Limnoithona species, they may not be very effective replacement prey for these fish, whether it's because they're too small, they are too fast, or they do not fall into the salinity range of these fish that need, um, that are want to eat. So then this brings up another question, right? So why are copepod abundances so low? Well, it could be because they have a low growth rate. So on this graph, let me orange you uh, real quick. The x-axis shows chlorophyll A concentration. The y-axis shows the growth rate of a calanoid copepod pseudodaptinus pulvisi. And I only need you to focus on the black data points on this graph. They represent measurements from the lower San Francisco estuary, or sorry, sorry measurements from different locations in the San Francisco estuary. And those black data points, they show that growth rates are low even when we have um, high concentration of chlorophyll. And when we look at this graph, the, chlor the chlorophyll concentration, it's really just a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. But just by looking at this, we can't really know what phytoplankton cells those copepods are eating. We don't know if those copepods are eating low or high quality prey. Um, we do know copepods eat things like diatoms, cryptophytes, ciliates. These types of prey are considered nutritious because they provide copepods with a really essential fatty acids that can impact their growth. Therefore, so if the copepod's growth rate, um, it should be positively related to the high concentrations of these nutritious foods containing these essential fatty acids. 
However, when we look back at this graph, we're not seeing that positive relationship here. And that makes me wonder, you know, is it because there's not enough nutritious food available? Or is it because the cobra bugs are not eating that food? Um, we don't know just from looking at this graph. So I don't think that um, to answer the questions I'm coming up with, uh, looking at just growth rate and food availability is not giving me a, the, the clear picture. And um, we need a more refined view of what type of food and what quality of food these copepods are eating to get a better answer about the copepods diet. Now, copepods will also eat other particles in the water column like detritus and cyanobacteria. These particles will provide carbon for energy that the copepods can use. And then cyanobacteria, they will, um, the cyanobacteria will contain nutrients like nitrogen for copepods to use. However, we have to remember that cyanobacteria are not very rich in fatty acids, so they're probably not going to promote copepod growth. But I will caveat this with that it's not always black and white. For example, in the Kimura lab, we have seen a relationship between cyanobacteria and copepod growth. So it's possible that there's something else going on. For example, the copepods do feed a lot on cyanobacteria while supplementing their diet with um, things like diatoms or that do give them that and the essential fatty acids they need. Well, to look more into diet, um, one of the former students in the Kimura lab, Ann Holmes, she did a really interesting study using DNA sequencing to reveal the diet of the copepod pseudodaptinus forbici. So on, in this figure, we have two main panels. One shows the taxa found in the copepod's gut. And the other panel shows the taxa that were found in the water columns those copepods were collected in. And so what I want you to take away from this is that when you look at the guts, um, the taxa in the guts, you're seeing a lot of that light blue color, and that is the dolichospermum, a type of cyanobacteria showing up in the guts. Whereas in the water column, you're not seeing a lot of that light blue color. And conversely, when you look at the water, you're seeing a lot of that yellow. That's the cryptophytes. And you're not seeing a lot of that yellow in the copepod's gut. And so this brought up a really, this was very intriguing because we often believe that copepods are going to choose or going to select for more nutritious, larger cells of prey like the cryptophytes and would more likely uh, avoid the cyanobacteria. But um, that didn't seem to be the case in the results and homes found. And this could be due to a few different things. Maybe the, maybe the copepods are selecting for cyanobacteria and getting some of their energy requirements from the, those cells. It could also be because um, of an indirect consumption is what we're seeing here. And maybe those cyanobacteria were hitchhiking on other prey like mycozone plankton, but they, were, uh, they showed up in the, in the results here. Um, another Another reason we could be seeing these results is that um, it's an artifact of the methodology that Ann Holmes used. So she used next generation sequencing, which is a really great tool when you want to look at the diversity like this in the copepods diet. Um, this tool uses a general primer, so it can bind to a wide array of taxa, which is obviously great for this type of study. But um, it does only produce semi-quantitative data that only shows relative abundance of each prey. So if we want to look at something more quantitative, we can use quantitative polymerase chain reaction, or qPCR. So the Kimmerer lab had a chance to use this tool um, when, there was a, when we wanted to know more about how the 2016 diatom bloom that happened in the estuary affected our food web out there. And so we use qPCR to quantify the number of diatom cells from that bloom that were eaten by um, the copepod pseudodaptinus forbici. And so in this figure, you're seeing um, the different sample stations over four sampling dates and how many cells copepods were consuming during that time. And this is just to show kind of the um, possibilities that we can um, have with using qPCR as a tool in answering ecological questions. This is another figure from that study. And um, on the y-axis, you see egg production, which is a proxy for the copepod's growth rate. And on the 
sorry, that was the y-axis. And then the x-axis, you're seeing um, the percent carbon required per day for these cocoa pods to grow. And so we see that um, the cocoa pods are growing. You can see that along the y-axis. But um, the carbon that they need to grow isn't coming well, from the diatom bloom, um, not a lot of it at least. So this kind of showed us that not every bloom is going to feed into the food web, at least maybe not through this specific cocoa pod species. And the remaining co carbon that these cocoa pods needed um, for their growth, if it wasn't coming from this bloom, then it must have been coming from a different food source. So what I really want to do is explore the potential for that other food source to be, you know, what if it is cyanobacteria? And so I'll be, I've been using qPCR to take a closer look at the copepod consumption of cryptocytes and cyanobacteria, specifically the copepod pseudodapinus forbici. And so remember when, from Ann Holmes' uh, results, we saw that the copepod guts contained very few uh, cryptocytes, however, the water contained a lot of cryptocyte DNA. And opposite to that, the copepod guts had a lot of cyanobacteria in them but very little cyanobacteria DNA came up from the water. So I want to know if the method I'm using, qPCR, will provide similar results to what Ann Holmes found. Um, so the research questions I'm focused on, the first one is, um, is P. forbici consuming more biomass of cyanobacteria or cryptocytes? Um, this hopefully will help answer whether um, my results look similar to Anne's and how they compare to her methodology. Second of all, I want to know if P. forbici is consuming more cyanobacteria during the day or the nighttime. The species of copepod migrates diurnally, so at night they're going to be closer to the surface feeding on whatever they can access up there, such as diatoms and cryptophytes. Um, but maybe during the daytime while they're near the bottom, they are feeding, and maybe they're feeding on cyanobacteria, and I want to know um, if that's the case or not. And then finally, I would like to know um, if capethidites, the juveniles, are they consuming cyanobacteria as well? And if they are, how does that consumption compare to adults? Um, I'd like to know if cyanobacteria is part of the, the species diet across several life stages. So to answer these questions, I went through the motions we all do in doing this type of research. I went into the field. We um, sampled in three different tidal wetland locations in um, the upper estuary region. I collected copepods with the plankton net and collected water um, simultaneously and with a Van Dorn sampler. I preserved the copepods in 95% ethanol to make sure they were, uh, could be used in DNA analysis. Water samples were kept on ice until I could filter them, um, and I filtered as soon as I could. Um, concurrently, I was preparing um, making primers for the taxa that I was interested in um, looking at in the guts of these copepods. And so I specified my primer design for Dolichospermum and Pyramonidale, because those were the two taxa that were relatively highly abundant from Ann Holmes's research. Um, but after creating them, I had to make sure that they worked. So I went through a bunch of testing to make sure that they were effective in binding to only the taxa that I am looking for. And I used um, monocultures I created of uh, cryptocyte and um, cyanobacteria to make sure that the primers were working. And they did, so that was great news. The cultures I had of these two types of algae was also used to help create standards for the qPCR, but I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then, of course, there was a lot of sample processing. I went through the different samples to pick out adult females, and then C4 and C5 capepidites. And once I had all of my, um, my organisms sorted, I extracted their, extracted their DNA using a DNA extraction kit. So once I had all of those pieces ready to go, I was able to then optimize my primers. I know that they worked, but I needed to make sure that they were working under the best temperature conditions, that I was using the appropriate concentration for the reaction to be working most effect effectively, 
And also, I had to find the best compatible tax polymerase to use with the primers I, was, um, I created. Also, you know, I had to become basically a pipetting wizard, and I'd say I'm like 90% there. Um, but really, this is kind of where I ended off before quarantine started in March, and I was just on the cusp of beginning some real um, reaction runs. And so once I can get back into the lab, um, I will hopefully start collecting some real data from the samples I've been, I collected. But um, I did want to orient you to these plots. These are amplification plots that show um, a few things. One, so these arrows are showing the different standards that, um, excuse me, <coughs> the different standards that I've created. And so basically, these, um, they create a map on the plot that helped me quantify the number of cells in my samples. So for example, this cluster of lines here, they represent um, environmental samples or water samples. And so I know because they sit that far back in the graph um, before my 10,000 cell standard that those samples likely contain more than 10,000 cells. And this cluster of lines here um, represents some gut samples from my um, copepods. And so it's likely that they contain less than 100 cells in um, those samples. So hopefully my standards, I've been testing them as well, and they've been showing up to be um, working properly, and they will help me quantify um, what I'm looking for in these, in these samples. And then so, you know, just to go over what my research goals are, I'm really looking forward to understanding um, how much biomass of these two taxa um, are in the guts of these copepods. How much are they really consuming of them? Um, you know, are they consuming more cyanobacteria during the nighttime or daytime? And how does their feeding behavior work into their diurnal behavior, if it does at all? And finally, I'm really interested to see the difference in abundance of um, these taxa in the guts versus the water and how that compares to Ann Holmes's work. Now, I obviously care about this, but why should you guys care? Well, I hope that many of you listening, you know, already do care and I don't need to convince you, but I will say that it's been a real, really exciting to be able to use these molecular analysis tools to um, answer an ecological question, and I know that's happening a lot more now. Um, and so I'm excited to see how my research can contribute to that lexicon of work that's um, really, uh, you know, taking off in the uh, recent years. And then um, copepods, you know, they're small. You can barely see them with naked eye, but they're a really important part of our food web, um, especially in our estuary. So learning more about their feeding behavior and dynamics and how that plays into the overall food web is um, always important information to add to what we already know. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone who's been a real help to making this work um, happen and also to my funding sources. And if there's time, I am happy to take questions. Thanks, Cheryl. It was great to uh, hear a little bit about your, your work and also to see its relevance to the, uh, the Delta Science Program and the Delta ISB's work. So I'll, I'll just open the floor for questions from the board. Uh, Liz, this is Vince. Uh, Cheryl, I was wondering if you could even go back a little further. You know, how did you get interested in wanting to work in the Bay and Delta, and what's your background before that? Hi, Vince. Thanks for the question. So, um, I, you know, I grew up in South Bay of um, the Bay Area, and I didn't even know that I had this large, amazing estuary in my backyard. But um, I really became interested in wetland ecology specifically when I had a chance to work in a mangrove system. Um, down in Central, uh, Central America. And once I realized that, you know, an, a wetland ecosystem is often usually um, close to, you know, human communities, and that was the case in that mangrove as well, I realized that there's no way to really conserve any of this without thinking about and integrating 
the people who are involved in that system. Um, and so I looked for, and so ever since then, I, I was convinced that I, I was going to continue working in um, wetlands, and I was able to find the perfect position and um, kind of uh, uh, the interests that I had aligned pretty well with what um, my PI's interests are. Um, and so I found the program that uh, at the Estuarine Ocean Science Center that was focused not only on marine systems, but um, estuaries as well, and I thought this was a good fit. Um, and it kind of just went up, from, went out from there. And now I'm excited to be at the at the council and at the science program because it kind of goes back to that first um, that first inspiration of working um, in a wetland system, but thinking about the people who use it as well as the wildlife. Uh, th thank you, Cheryl. Was the mangrove system in Belize? Is that the one you worked on? Oh, no, sorry. It, it was in Costa Rica. It was in um, this ah. small area in um, northwest Costa Rica. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from members of the board? Well, I, I have a couple of questions. So one mm -hmm. is maybe just a, a clarification. In the graph that you showed where um, you had the relationship between egg production and carbon need, mm -hmm. I was just curious how you calculated carbon need or, or what that was based on. Uh, so um, that was based on a lot of background work that we have done in the Kimura lab. Um, we've done a lot of growth rate work that then um, that was based on the foundation of doing, um, I guess, looking at how much carbon each copepod um, contains through different life stages and calculating how much carbon need is needed for growth um, for between those life stages. And so it's, a lot of that work is really just from a lot of um, great people in the camera lab from the past few uh, years, if not decade. <laughs> Great. Yeah, it's nice to be able to build on the, the foundation of work that's been done in that lab. Mm -hmm. And then I have, I guess I had a second question, which was, it seems like your project is very much focused on phytoplankton support for copepods. And mm -hmm. I was interested in uh, your thoughts about the paper by Hoffman and all that came out last year which showed the importance of detritus and how, how that might, you know, factor into uh, your, your efforts and the interpretation of your results. That is interesting. Um, well, you know what, I, in my, in on some of my background reading, I have found other papers that talked about how detritus is a food source for copepods as well. And while I will say that that is not something I intended to focus on specifically because if I think of focusing on detritus, I think of, you know, if there are algae mats that are cyanobacteria mats at the bottom of the um, water column where these copepods are spending time during the day, if they're eating that, they are probably also feeding on detritus while they're down there, it's likely. But um, because my primers are specifically looking at very um, targeted taxa, I'm not going to pick up on anything that might be detritus, knowingly at least. And so I think that looking at cyanobacteria in the first place and seeing how it plays a role in um, the diet is just another one step before looking even further into how detritus then plays a role in um, the diet of these copepods. And I understand that. <laughs> It's, it's easy to kind of think, oh, this is nutritious, and so this is what they need, and this is more important. But um, we, we constantly, you know, tell ourselves to look at things more holistically, and I think diet is one of those things where holistic understanding and um, perspective is also important. Great. But thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Sure, I can ask about the, uh, the how the uh, copepods actually manage to eat a filamentous blue-green alga. 
it, to me, it seems like they get wound up in it and wouldn't be able to feed on it. But I could see them eating the um, the, the individual single-celled blue greens. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so that is definitely one of the reasons uh, a lot of, um, well, a lot of lab studies that do uh, feeding experiments with uh, these filamentous algae, we do find that um, feeding is slowed down because it's harder to um, manipulate those longer filamentous uh, chains of cyanobacteria. But some studies, or at least a, a paper I'm thinking of, talked about how the copepod would kind of break it up into pieces. And again, you know, it's not going to be the same between a lab feeding study and something happening out in the in the estuary. But if they're able to cut it into smaller pieces, they are able to feed on these uh, filamentous algae. But I'm hoping. I mean, I guess I'll see what what it looks like when I get my results right. <laughs> Also, are there any toxicity issues uh, between um, the kinds of blue greens that might be food for copepods? Right, toxicity is another issue, right? So the, the algae that I'm looking for isn't particularly toxic in um, our estuary, and that taxa of cyanobacteria is not the only one that, you know, Ann Holmes found in the guts of these copepods. So. I, I can't say for sure um, how toxicity might have played a role in what she was able to find of the different cyanobacteria that the copepods ate, but for at least the genus that I'm targeting, I don't think that toxicity is um, plays a big role in that um, in that in that genus at least. Is it anabina? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, that, that was sort of a, a warm-up for your defense. I know, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we appreciate the opportunity to have you present to us your, your master's, master's project work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, th thank you, Cheryl, and it, it, we're, we are very, excited and uh, interested in onboarding you and engaging you in the Delta ISB's work. Thank you. It's been great so far, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the year for sure. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, before we move on, are there any comments from the public on Cheryl's presentation? There are none. Okay, so uh, so Edmund, I see that the next item on our agenda is a 30-minute break. We're, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, so I'm wondering, should we keep going or should we take a break now? Um, that's up to the board. If you guys feel like we need a break before entering discussion, we can take one now or we can continue with one more item before going on a break. Are there any uh, preferences amongst board members? I'd be happy to keep on going, Dick Mogard. Okay. And yeah, but why don't why don't we um, take the the next discussion item and and then we'll take a break after that. So the, the next item on the agenda is discussion and, uh, well, yeah, discussion and potential action on planning future reviews. Um, this has been a topic that we have visited a, a couple of times in, in recent months. So in gen, at our meeting on January 31st, we had a discussion about planning future reviews. And as a follow-up item, we asked 
continuing members of the Delta ISB, whether there were topics that they were interested in leading reviews on based on uh, the responses that we had received from stakeholders and uh, our planning documents. So they, the idea is that these are reviews that would be initiated after the current reviews are done. And so they would be uh, led by members of the board who are members, who are currently members, just because they have the experience and uh, have been through the review process. But the idea also is to engage the new members of, of the board and have board work um, that they can easily transition into as they begin their terms on the Delta ISB. So today, uh, the purpose was is really to continue that discussion. Um, we have topics from two current board members. Joe Fernando has uh, proposed a review on water quality and hydrodynamic modeling that he is interested and, and willing to lead. And Tom Holzer has uh, offered the topic of subsidence reversal as a, a, a topic of interest to him and of, and of course, you know, one that is of interest to the board and the Delta Science community. So we, we have brief descriptions of each of those topics in the meeting package for today's meeting. And I thought maybe I would just begin by turning things over to Joe and Tom to say a few words about the reviews that they've proposed. So uh, maybe Joe, would you, would you like to start? Uh, yes. Um, so this is on water quality and uh, hydrodynamic modeling. Uh, in fact, this was kind of suggested by uh, Jay Lund that I should uh, think about it. So I contacted a few people in Delta who are working on difficult, uh, different issues related to water quality hydrodynamic models. And they all felt that a review might be appropriate at this time because there are so many different models are used for water quality calculations and they have different levels of institutional support, different level of um, people who are, have expertise on these models. They are sometimes used, they are using sometimes in-house build models. Sometimes they use models that basically have general validity kind of imported from other places. So, um, so people felt that uh, people who are working on this, which who I contacted, felt that it would be uh, it would be timely to have some sort of review about the the modeling enterprise uh, covering water quality and hydrodynamics uh, for Delta. Um, so, uh, so that's where we stand. And also, these folks uh, agreed that they will help us in getting information, uh, but it will follow the normal procedures of having a workshop as well as getting questionnaires and all these things. Um, so uh, if, it, if it is of interest to the board, then I would be happy to lead with the help of my colleagues. Great, Th thank you, Joe. And, and that would be both a, a nice follow-on from our previous review that focused on water quality and, and also a, a nice integration of the topic of water quality with your expertise in modeling and, and engineering. So I'll, I'll just open uh, the discussion up to the full board to comment or provide uh, feedback to Joe on the possibility of a review on this topic. So this is Tracy. Um, one thing on the water quality and hydrodynamic modeling, Joe, um, and Liz, your follow-on about our water quality, we expressly said that we were going to also tackle the more conventional aspects of water quality 
um, in the Delta, and this might be a good opportunity to, to do that because I'm sure what Joe, what you're talking about is primarily the conventional water quality parameters, salinity and DO, et cetera. Um, right. And we should com we could combine that second phase of water quality science review with the hydrodynamic modeling, which I think sounds like a good combination to make. All right. Mm -hmm. So you mean in the same review, or is it different review? So our re our review was of non-conventional water quality parameters, uh, the contaminants and you know pesticides, mercury. Yes, I remember. But what I'm asking, crazy, is that that will be kind of folded out, folded out into this I think, review? I, I think it could be folded into this review because I think you could summarize the state of science on conventional water quality as it affects the delta, you know, both human and, and ecological systems. Um, and then the, the big, then that would be more a summary, I would think, and then the big uh, review of hydrodynamic modeling and how we how is the science underlying the modeling used to better assess and especially predict water quality? So what we are saying is that that we uh, since we are kind of concentrating on water quality water quality modeling aspect, we will kind of fold that, those parameters into the modeling aspect rather than the chemical and other aspects. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me it may be it maybe gets too big of a review to do that way, but it seems like. We should, if we don't do that, then we maybe should do a, and it's easy for me to say because I won't be there, but we should um, do a, a summary of conventional water quality parameter science. Um, and whether to combine that with your modeling review focused on water quality, I, I can't say, but the two seem pretty uh, compatible to me. Okay. Yeah, some, some summary of that sort, but not an in-depth uh, because that kind of will be too broad for a, for a one, I, I would imagine, because so much water quality uh, sciences have been have been done. Maybe getting into one uh, review with hydrodynamics may be a little bit too broad. So we can have a summary, as you said. Yeah. The the type of yes. Okay. Okay. And at least some of the uh, I think conventional water quality parameters that we're thinking about, like the limit salt was one of them and dissolved oxygen. Um, I know for oxygen there are both biological and physical controls, but some, some of these more conventional water quality parameters are tied to the, the physics, and so I, I see how at least some of them could be linked to the hydrodynamic modeling component. Yeah, that's true because most of the time to do the, the modeling, you have to connect with the hydrodynamic part. So that kind of goes well. Other comments or suggestions? Yeah, this is Jay. I, I think this is a really great topic, very timely um, uh, topic for review. Um, one of the questions you'll have to think about is how much of the context for the modeling do you want to build in, into the review in terms of the major problems and what we know about the problems that the modeling is supposed to address? That sounds good. So, so Joe, I think uh, when w once the new members uh, join the team, I think it'll be important to continue discussion of this review topic, and um, maybe it, it, if it resonates with the new board members, uh, then to prepare a, a prospectus. Uh, oh, sure. That, you know that that would define the the scope of of the review and and the approach. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, this is uh, Steve here. I, I also really like this idea, and I I think it's really uh, timely, and I think it hits on a lot of things. I particularly like the uh, what you're saying in the first sentence of the second paragraph about the um, 
that you're going to include the transport of sediments, nutrients, and species. I know that's something that kind of came up in the Fish and Flows report early on, and I think that uh, uh, having an assessment of the, those kind of models will really be useful. This is John. I would also let you know there's the, the Integrated Modeling Steering Committee uh, has been pushing for, you know, this improved models that work across hydrodynamics, nutrients, and all the issues Steve just highlighted. So I think there's some opportunity for synergy with, with that work um, as well. And certainly there's interest. Right. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so, so now we'll uh, turn things over to Tom to introduce a, a topic that he is interested in leading, and, and that's the topic of subsidence reversal. Uh, thanks, Liz. Some of you, probably all of you, remember <laughs> in the uh, uh, performance measures that we reviewed. Uh, one of the performance measures, I think it was 412, was uh, entitled subsidence uh, reversal. And uh, that's really what triggered my motivation for, for this. Uh, and um, some of you may remember the uh, uh, field trip we were uh, on out in the Delta where we looked at the experiment uh, where they're actually um, trying to reverse uh, subsidence by encouraging organic soil accumulation by managing uh, the water table. Um, and it can get a little confusing because there's actually two different things going on here that sort of fall under the subsidence reversal. Um, there's that field trip we went on, which really is a deeply subsided island. And then what our performance measure really was about was the uh, intertidal areas and the concern that with sea level uh, many of the um, intertidal areas, uh, unless they're carefully managed, won't be able to keep up and will become open water. So um, you really have these two situations, but they're they're linked in that the, through the uh, organic soils that that underlie them. And uh, one of the concerns I have is that. Um, we're not thinking long enough term with these organic soils. That um, organic soils, from a soils perspective, from an engineering perspective, are, are really kind of uh, different. Uh, and for example, they're very compressible, so that uh, if we introduce um, a process to encourage the soil, the organic soil, to uh, increase in thickness, uh, it's probably going to consolidate, and it. The consolidation process for organic soils has a, a time-dependent factor in it. So it, it's not clear to me that we know fully what the future holds if we start encouraging uh, subsidence reversal. It's possible that just the consolidation of these soils could end up uh, compromising some of the, the effort that's involved. So anyway, it was this kind of thinking that led me to uh, appreciate that it would be worthwhile to get all the people who are working on subsidence to identify uh, where our gaps are in our understanding of process and then um, um, perhaps address the state of the uh, practice. And this has huge implications beyond just uh, maintaining land surface elevation. The stability of the levees would be uh, part of this uh, so that um, it, it would probably take a pretty comprehensive uh, workshop to address all these issues, but we'd focus primarily on the uh, the, the science of uh, the, the process of subsidence reversal and then uh, um, address some of the state of uh, practice. So um, that, that, that's the essence of what I was uh, thinking of here. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tom. I, I think that is a nice follow-on to uh, the discussion we had uh, when we were working through the performance measures. I, I remember uh, being a little bit fuzzy in my mind what uh, 
what was intended by subsidence reversal and, you know, I, I guess sort of, uh, you know, just un unsure what those processes meant o over the long term. It, it, it's one thing to uh, maybe stop or slow subsidence for a short period of time, but then how do those measures play out over long time scales? Mm -hmm. it, I think maybe is, is less clear. So I, I think it's a, a very important topic and uh, you, your expertise and, and background would would be excellent for leading that topic. Um, any yeah, questions? And, it, 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 and Sorry, Liz, it would include more than just subsidence reversal. It would re include subsidence stoppage because there's actually a, a currently a pretty serious effort uh, through uh, land management practices to uh, stop subsidence, which is important for the long-term uh, stability of the levees. So um, I, we, we, we would include that in the uh, discussion. Right. And any questions, comments, feedback for Tom about this topic? Sure, this is Karen. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really excited about this topic. I think there's a lot to explore here. Um, but one of the things that we think about in subsidence reversal in the in the delta is also the greenhouse gas angle. So greenhouse gas reductions by stopping subsidence because the oxidation of peat soils is producing greenhouse gases, and also um, carbon sequestration through subsidence, certain kinds of subsidence reversal processes. Um, and so just curious your thoughts on um, greenhouse gas and interactions with this topic. Yeah, uh, Karen, that's an excellent point. And um, I, I had a nice conversation with uh, Campbell Ing Ingram. Uh, we, we talked about the carbon sequestration issue because that is a big aspect of uh, how we manage the um, organic soils. And the concern there is that that's a big enough topic by itself that uh, including it in in this review, uh, y y you might have two fairly uh, different and competing objectives. And in one case, you're trying to manage the subsidence. And in the other case, you're concerned about carbon sequestration, uh, which, which is a broad topic by itself. So. At this point, I'd be a little apprehensive about linking the, the two, um, maybe including an awareness of that aspect of it, but not making it the focus. Thanks, Tom. And you, you probably got from your conversation with Campbell, but one of the ways potentially, one of the, the great potential mechanisms for uh, encouraging folks to engage in subsidence reversal is the greenhouse gas market and the fact that um, there might be money in converting to this land use. So um, I understand your reticence to include it uh, comprehensively, um, but it will probably come up in any way just mm -hmm. as a mention of the relationship between those and the relationship of that market to incentivizing people to engage in this activity. Yeah, I, where I could see it coming in is um, where um, I, I visualize, visualize us focusing on sort of the science of uh, organic soils and then uh, the state of practice in terms of how we're managing them and the sequestration could be an aspect of the management um, so that we, we would talk about it, but we um, wouldn't get immersed in the, um, the complexity of it. Any other uh, this is Jay. I think this is a really nice topic. Um, one, of the, one of the major problems of the Delta is, of course, land subsidence and the implications that has for flooding as well as what happens after flooding in terms of habitat and the like. So uh, and we certainly spend millions of dollars a year on 
subsidence reversal. Um, so I think it's about time to summarize a lot of that uh, scientific work and technical work and, and put that in the context for how this should be considered in the long term. Other comments for Tom? So uh, again, Tom, like uh, I mentioned to Joe, the, I think the discussion on this topic should certainly continue after the new members joined the team in August of 2020. And, you know, assuming there'll, there will be interest and there's also talent in that group that aligns with this review, then you can, uh, the next steps would be to you know, identify a team to re to uh, lead the review and begin working on a, a perspective that sort of defines the the scope of, of the review and the approaches that would be used. Yeah, I understand. Any other uh, discussion may maybe brought more broadly about future reviews, so not necessarily tied to these topics, but I'm, I'm just interested in hearing from members of the board what, what their thoughts are about future reviews. Liz, this is uh, Steve here. I just wanted to keep the door open on what we might learn from the science needs assessment. I think that uh, we're talking a lot about sort of future management needs and uh, future science needs in the context of a, a changing delta. And I think there'll be a lot of ideas that come out of that. And it will, when the new board members will be arriving, we'll, we will be about halfway through that process. But keeping an eye on that, and looking for ideas and suggestions, I think might be a useful approach. I totally agree. I think that's a great idea. And, you know, the the point of having these discussions on the current board, again, was not to be too prescriptive about directions that, uh, that, that the new board members might want to take, but to, but to have some ideas and, you know, some uh, topics that, uh, that, you know, are, are appropriate and, and complementary to uh, ongoing issues in the Delta, but yeah, definitely uh, keeping tabs on the science needs assessment and ideas that come out of that. Other comments or feedback? So yeah, so again, uh, the idea is that will sort of uh, move these topics, you know, uh, to be t priority topics for future discussions by, by the board about directions they'd like to take in, in terms of their review activities. And uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure that that topic will be revisited in August when we have the incoming Delta ISB members in attendance and will continue um, once they begin their, their terms. Okay, so um, let's see, any public comment on uh, the topic of future reviews? Um, there is one. Let me just pull it up really quick, Liz. Great. Thank you, Edmund. So this is from Linda Smith from the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. 
her comment is just a general comment that I support both of the review topics discussed this morning. And agree they are timely. Metropolitan will likely be interested in providing input to the reviews. Thank you. And that's all the comments I see so far. Great. Thank you, Linda, for your your comment on these topics. And it, it's always good to know that um, you know there'll be that that there's interest in the larger community in the topics that we pursue for our reviews, and and that there's a willingness to provide feedback on on the reviews. All right, so uh, at this point in our agenda, I think this would be a good opportunity for us to take a 30-minute break before we um, resume and finish up a, a couple of the other items on our agenda. So let me just see. So I think so. it's maybe 11. Is that right? 1108 on the West Coast. Um, so, let, so let's let's say that we will resume at 1140 Pacific time. And uh, yes. Yeah. Anyway, any any comments on on taking a break, or is everybody fine with that time frame? Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, so people can just uh, dial back in after the break. We'll um, move on to agenda item eight, which is discussion and potential action related to our operating guidelines. So uh, I just begin with a little bit of context. Uh, the Delta ISD last revised the operating guidelines in December of 2015. And we also, uh, I guess, discussed some potential revisions in July of, of 2017. I'm, I don't remember the, the fate of those discussions. But um, today, it, and in the near term, we have an opportunity to discuss revisions um, because members of the board will be terming out, so to speak, by the end of August. Um, and in the operating guidelines, amendments can be made if approved by two-thirds majority of the Delta ISB members. So today, we're not going to make any revisions for approval at, at this meeting. But we will uh, be discussing some potential revisions that we'll uh, probably cover again and uh, discuss at our June meeting. So really what I wanted to do was just to initiate some discussion about potential revisions to the operating guidelines. And it, in part, this is being brought about by the fact that my uh, term, my two-year term as chair um, lasts longer than my term on the board. So my, my term on the board will end in August, at the end of August 2020, while my term as chair actually theoretically would continue through May 31st, 2021. So because I'm unable to complete my full term as chair of the Delta ISB, uh, and also because we don't have any succession in the current operating guidelines, um, I, I thought that we would um, initiate some discussion of, of succession uh, and, and make sure that a succession plan was included in, in the guidelines as we move forward. And um, it, it's also, so, so the first part of this discussion relates to what happens when the chair vacates their position prematurely. 
and uh, I've offered some proposed wording, and th this is not legalistic wording, and it's also subject to your input, of, of course, uh, as well, but I, I just wanted to uh, maybe put out the suggestion that if the chair is unable to complete their term, the, the chair elect would be elevated to the chair position and would begin their term, their two-year term at, at that point. Um, in, in this case, we have a, a bit of a complication because Jay has recently announced that he will be stepping down as chair-elect, and so we're in a position where we need to also address what happens when neither the chair nor the chair-elect are able to, uh, well, when the chair-elect is unable to assume for the chair position. So, so uh, anyway, so I tried to address that as well, that um, in, in that case, we would rely on the past chair to move back into the chair position. And uh, in that case, I'm suggesting that maybe the past chair, because they will have already completed a term of service, that they would just complete the remainder of, of the chair's position. Um, so that that's a little bit of background that brings us to this discussion today. And um, I don't know, maybe we want to take each of those issues up separately. Um, I'd be interested in hearing from board members about um, how they feel about the first part, that if a chair is unable to complete their term, that the chair elect would be moved up into the chair position and, and that they would begin their two-year term. I think that clarification is very logical and should simply be made. Um, so, yeah, I would move that we just go forward with that. I agree. I guess I'm. We're all get all of us who've just agreed are getting off the board at the end of August. I'm curious what the four continuing board members think. This is Joe. I think it's it's a very reasonable way to go. So I I am in full full support of this. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, this is Tom. It's fine with me. This is Jay. I don't have a better idea. I think it's great. Okay, so it seems like we're all okay with that. With that. Um, so, so then the I, I think we heard from everyone. I, I don't know, Joy. Did you? I didn't hear from you. Did you have anything to add to the discussion? Are you okay with if the chair is unable to complete their work that the chair elect would? No, I think this is a good idea. Has the uh, Prior chair agreed to serve? Does Steve agree to serve? Well, I guess we, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Oh, <laughs> I mean, okay. I thought this, yeah, well, I, I thought guess we're, just, we're just discussing it in the abstract that this would be the policy okay. that okay. Yes. The, the chair then, then, then I agree uh, wholeheartedly. And then, um, how do how do folks feel about the second part of this discussion? You know, if we find ourselves in a situation like we have now, where we don't have a chair elect to move into the position that we rely on the past chair to finish out the term of of the chair. At least this is Joe. I, I'm okay with it, but if uh, 
cash share will say no, what would be the option? Uh, I guess should, maybe we should also have that contingency. I guess if the, I don't know, I think in that case there would have to just be an election of a full slate of new leadership. Yeah, that, but, maybe that you might want to mention that. You know, I'd, I'd be in Fine not to dig that deeply into the problem because, you know, you can imagine all kinds of scenarios. So let's take the most likely one and then uh, deal with the others when they come rather than try and establish a policy that locks us in. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Tom. I think it's overcomplicating it. I think if the, uh, um, the first sentence is probably full insufficient. And I think if we have a chair elect in a position somewhere down the line and they just say they, they want to step off, then we elect a new chair elect. And I think that, um, you know, that we could do within our own existing policies. We already have in our clause that if on any given day the chair cannot run the meeting, then the chair elect runs the meeting, and then the past chair is the backup for that. That's already in our current guidelines, and that could be true from day to day. So, um, or meeting to meeting, I don't think there's a time limit on that. So, I think just the first sentence is probably sufficient, and uh, probably covers most cases. So, uh, but would we need to have maybe the second sentence to just say if the if the chair elect is unable to assume the chair position, a new chair elect will be uh, will be voted upon or something like that. I, I you, think you can that's, just... that would be more of a general approach than automatically kicking it back to the past chair. Uh -huh. and, and I think you could leave the last sentence you have in there, the first and last sentence, the last sentence being the election will be held as soon as feasible for the chair elect. Yeah, that that was actually not, that was not intended to be policy. That, that was just intended to be how we were going to handle this. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so I'm scratching that last sentence and changing the first one to say, if the chair elect is unable to assume the chair position, a new chair elect will be elected. Or will be voted upon. Or, okay. Yeah. So should I read that back to folks? I, I, again, this is not the, the final version, but um, what, one thing we'll ask you to do is to take a look at this uh, wording and, and think about it um, so that maybe we can vote on language at our June meeting. So the, the language that I have right now is if the chair is unable to complete their term, the chair elect will be elevated to the chair position and begin their two-year term. If the chair elect is unable to assume the chair position, a new chair elect will be voted upon. Or, yeah, is that too awkward, will be elected or, or selected? It seems to me that we're reacting too much to the current situation and that, you know, if any officer is unable to continue, I guess we don't do this for the past chair, but any, you know, if the current chair or chair elect are unable to continue their service, then new elections will be held. But it's not just 
the chair like it's, it could be any position. So, yeah, so we could just generalize that too. If Yeah, and I think the more general, the better the whole thing is. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Dick. I, I was, yeah, I, I, I think general flexible language serves the board best. So, yeah, so sorry, you were saying like if any officer is unable to complete their term. Well, additional elections will be held for any office vacated uh, during the term of service or something. You know, maybe, maybe a, the general statement could be kind of like you have it is if the chair is unable to complete their term, the chair elect will be elevated to the chair position and begin their two year term. <clears throat> what that in essence, that's the wording. And what in essence that does, it leaves a blank spot at the chair elect. And then you could say an election will be held as soon as possible for the, to fill the chair elect position. Because when you go into it, you think you have three members, a past chair, a chair, and chair elect. The chair steps down, the chair elect steps in. That leaves one blank spot, and that's the former chair elect spot. So you just have them step in and have a new election to fill the chair elect spot. So the way you have it, I think the first and last sentence would probably be a, a cover most cases. Okay. And yeah, this is Karen. Uh, it's not overly specific to call out that the election would just be for the chair elect because that's the only position that's elected for. We don't, if the chair, if the past chair becomes vacant, we would not reelect for that. And should the chair become vacant, the chair elect moves into that. So the, the chair elect is the only position subject to a new vote. So it's fine, I think, to just call that out as Steve has done in, in the language he proposed. So, yeah, so we're basically kind of keeping the first and the last sentence of, of that passage of text. Maybe I'll, I'll just say as soon as possible instead of as soon as feasible. Okay, any, any other um, comments or thoughts about this? Okay. This is the very difficult part about teleconference is I can't see anybody, but I'm going to, so <laughs> what I, I'm going to assume we're sort of okay with, with this language and what we'll do is uh, I'll ask Edmund to distribute this, these two sentences to the board to think about and uh, we would ask that you would send any additional edits to the operating guidelines to staff by May 12th. And then uh, I'll work with staff to incorporate any edits that are forwarded so that we can have discussion at a, at a future meeting. Any comments or feedback on, on that process? Sounds good. All right, so uh, that brings us to agenda item nine, which is preparation for upcoming Delta ISB meetings. Sorry. Um, we are still 
planning to have future meetings be teleconferences at this point to help with the state's response to COVID-19, as well as I'm sure each of us is uh, dealing with travel restrictions in our, in our individual situations. But, but we will revisit our schedule on a month by month basis. Um, in June, we're planning that the teleconference meeting will be by Zoom rather than by WebEx. So we'll have an opportunity to try that platform. Um, so our June teleconference is scheduled for June the 12th. And at that meeting, we plan to take potential action on revising the operating guidelines. We will elect a new chair elect, um, and we'll also do some planning for the August 2020 meeting where, um, what, sorry, when incoming members will be present um, so we can be, assuming it is an in-person meeting, we can be thinking about training and um, orientation activities that, that we think uh, would be good to, to introduce the new board members to board activities. Um, and then we're also scheduled for a teleconference on July the 10th. Um, and at this point, uh, we don't really have anything fixed on the schedule for July 10th other than we would have status updates from the, the different activities of, of the board. Any comments or feedback on that tentative schedule? So as this is Tracy, I just was wondering, I mean, if we're gonna have a new election for the chair elect, um, it won't be Steve and it won't be Jay, presumably. So that means it'll be Tom or Joe. And I, and I understand we probably need to have the election, but I'm also wondering, is it possible to have, to defer that until after the new board is in place? Um, so the, the new members would have a say in that. And uh, maybe we, maybe Tom and Joe, you guys have already discussed it and, and we're good with that, but I'm just curious about that. Well, um, we, we have had um, some discussion within the present chairship leadership and also um, there has been some discussion with, with um, Joe and Tom. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm not sure we should. Yeah, probably shouldn't talk, talk about that. Talk but, yeah. Quickly at, at this time, unless unless somebody wants to say anything. I I think it might be best to wait until the June meeting because we we sort of have a tentative plan in place. Okay. And uh, okay, so yeah, so tell, so most likely teleconferences in June and July, hopefully an in-person meeting in August, but I, I think it maybe is too early to know for sure whether that will happen or not. It would be very disappointing if we just rotated off the board without ever seeing each other again. <laughs> We'd have to have some other excuse for reunion. Um, okay, let's see. So, so that's that's it. in as far as upcoming meetings, and so, and so that brings us to our agenda item ten, which is a review of items for follow up. So, I'll turn things over to Edmund. To 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 uh, initiate that, and I'll I'll sort of join in if if needed. Okay. 
So for the monitoring enterprise review, um, I, ha I have that the board should um, think about in the future based off a suggestion from Jay, um, creating like a standing group that monitors the monitoring enterprise over time. So that's like a suggestion for further consideration in the future. For, um, and then the questionnaire is also out, so as a follow-up item for our public members, um, if you have experience with monitoring, please complete that. That's on the meeting events page. For the ecosystems review, for um, on non-native species, um, Steve and John mentioned um, that they're targeting a public draft release for May 20th, um, so that might be available for discussion in June. For the water supply reliability review, um, the outline of the report is part of the today's meeting package. Individual members should look at the outline and get comments back um, by the end of next week. For, um, for the IEP review during the outreach phase, um, Tracy um, requested that individual members um, share any individual comments or concern about the current approach for um, implementation related to organizational structure. Um, individual members who led that review are providing um, some guidance to the IEP leadership, but they just want to make sure that they're not being too um, prescriptive of what direction is being offered. Um, and that one, I'm not sure if I properly captured your request, Tracy. Uh, that was pretty good. Okay. Um, before I move on, is there anything to add for um, the current reviews and activities? For um, our discussion on planning future reviews, um, there was um, a lot of interest to continue proceeding with water quality and hydrodynamic modeling and substance reversal. This will be revisited in August 2020 when both um, incoming Delta IRSP members along with the current members will be present. So the idea is that these ideas will be shared again and based off that discussion, new perspectives may be initiated. Another thing to keep on the ISB's radar um, is that the, the um, new ideas may emerge from the science needs assessment process. Um, for the discussion on operating guidelines, um, you, you would have until May 12th to um, review um, the current um, um, sentence for um, succession, and I'll just read it here, and I'll also circulate it by email. So um, pretty much it currently reads, if the chair is unable to complete their term, the chair elect will be elevated to the, to the chair position and begin their two-year term. An election will be held as soon as possible for the chair elect. Um, so you would have until May 12th to um, make any additional revisions to that sentence or and also anything that needs to be modified in the operating guidelines. Um, and then um, Liz will work with staff to um, have a red line version of the operating guidelines, um, hopefully um, for the June meeting to, um, to vote upon. Um, anything to um, add to that agenda item? Nope. I think maybe right. I, I would, Edmund, I would just suggest a slight rewording of the second part, just mm -hmm. to uh, an election will be held as soon as possible for a new chair elect. Okay. I'll, um, I, may, I, I may just edit, um, and then if you need to revise it further, you can when I um, when we seek individual feedback. All right, and then for planning for future meetings, um, pretty much um, we're gonna be transitioning to Zoom for the June meeting possibly. So just keep a lookout for that. And that's all I have for follow-up items. Um, please let me know if there's anything to add or change. I think you got everything, you captured everything that was on my list. Um, other members, did, does that sound like a complete list of follow-up items? I have a separate follow-up item. 
This is Joy, and I would just like to thank every member of the board and the staff for a very educational and rewarding experience. Thank you, Joy. Uh, we, you know, we feel the same about having the opportunity to have worked with you. Okay, uh, so uh, let's let's take a public comment now, and the public comments can be for matters that are not on the agenda, but within the subject matter jurisdi jurisdiction of the Delta ISB. There are none. All right. Any final? Comments or feedback from members of the board? Well, Joy, we are going to miss you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know where to find me. All right. So, uh, not hearing any further comments. Oh, sorry. Did someone want to speak? Okay. All right. Not not hearing any further comments. Uh, I propose that we adjourn the meeting, and I look forward to working with you and seeing our reviews move forward. And hope that everybody remains healthy and safe, and we have an opportunity to meet again in person in August. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, man. Bye-bye.